Okay, so I'm, I'm Carl Savage, and I'm actually passionate, since we're talking about passion today, about improving education. Uh, the short answer to this question is uh, almost nothing and a whole lot. Uh, but before we, we get into those answers, I want to start off by a little interactive part here. And I know you guys got back from coffee, and it's easy to sit down and feel comfortable and let this post prandial <laughs> depression set in. So uh, I want to ask you a really simple question. We'll start off really simple here. Uh, if you're like I was about uh, a decade and a half ago, and uh, you're really interested in becoming a doctor because you think that this is the passion, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life, what do you do? Go to school. Excuse me? Go to school. Go to school. Okay, and what kind of school would you go to then? Um. Medical university. Medical university, exactly. So that's actually a really simple question and, I, and a really simple answer, and I thought that too. Uh, so, so that was exactly what I was thinking. So I, I thought, I'd, okay, I go to a medical university, I'd become a doctor, and in, in, uh, in the way I chose in Sweden, it takes five and a half years to, to become a doctor there. And I thought that was really good, and I was really excited. And then, and then all of a sudden, yeah, I found out that they're going to reform the entire education. And if I was tweeting at that point, I'd be typing WTF. Yeah. And here I am, I'm going to be a doctor, and now they're going to change everything on me. What, what were they thinking? Uh, it turns out they were actually kind of right. Uh, this isn't an uncommon occurrence. And about 75% of deans and associate deans in the US were accorded in the same question. They asked about 1,600 of them. And the answer was that three-fourths thought that we need some serious thorough reform. And, and going into this, 1910 is a pivotal year in, in medical education, because that's when it changed. It's also about the last time it changed. It hasn't really changed since then at all. Uh, you remember like the Greeks, right? You'd follow and run after them. And then uh, that was really good. And, then, and so they started having medical education everywhere and became the art of medicine. And then this guy named Bierschoff in, in, uh, in Germany decided that pathology is the ultimate and everything else is just a sub-science to pathology, and that became the dominant, and that's actually what started and turned the U.S. into a powerhouse in terms of education. And they started in 1910, or right around that era. And the idea was that you should have universities working together with hospitals, and, and that the staff should be teaching basic science. And that's actually the interesting part. The, the people that are really driving the change, or the want to change, aren't the basic scientists. They're, they're usually the clinicians. Uh, and so, so, since 1910, not much has happened, which is kind of, kind of bothersome. It's, uh, there's been, uh, since this Flexner report came out then, there's been about 19 or 26, depending on how you count, major calls for reform in the U.S. alone. In Britain, there's been an enormous amount of these in terms of the tomorrow's doctors. And looking at these, you basically find that they're all saying the same thing. So for a hundred years, people have been trying to change medical education, and they're all wanting the same thing. And it's become so interesting that this phenomenon alone is worth studying for such sociologists who called it change without reform. So right now I'm thinking, not only did I choose medical education because I want to become a doctor, I found out that it's not that effective in becoming a doctor, and that everyone wants to change it, but no one's been able to change it, and it's going very, very dark. Uh, but of course, right before it goes uh, pitch black, it's a little darker, and there's hope somewhere in there. <laughs> and that is medical students, and, and they have this capacity to become doctors despite their education. <laughs> so, so that's great, but now I'm thinking, that's probably not the best way to, to become a good doctor, is to count out and figure out the problems of the system. So, Let's just take a step back and look at universities and the way we teach. Because that probably is one of the problems, that, that it's, it's not only how, you know, what we're teaching, but maybe how we're teaching it. And, and here we have sort of a standard picture from most universities in the world, and the way most u medical universities teach. It's this thing called a lecture. And a lecture is based on this idea, it's a, sort of a pyramid, you could think of it where you have truth, right? Uh, truth is something that, that only, only the teachers, the people who have the PhDs in the universities, have access to, because there's a barrier between truth, and you need some sort of degree to reach that. And then below, you have these other people, 
Uh, those people that aren't, you know, in, inside the university, the ones that have to pay or to come in, or that someone else pays for them, they're called the amateurs. They don't know much. And it's a job of the teacher, to sort of like, you can think of it as a pressure gradient, that more knowledge and then I put them in. So that we, we built things like lecture halls, where people sit in rows, and then you have a person who stands on the stage uh, with the red carpet, and I tell you, and I share with you my wisdom, because as you know now, I have a PhD. Uh, and, and so I'm thinking, this is great. Um, but, you know, this is something we've been doing for the last, oh, I don't know, this is a picture from the 1300s. And you think the universities, I don't know if someone might have heard of a computer or, or something else, things have changed in the world, but the universities have this resilience, which is admirable in, in ways to think about. Um, and, and if you can see here, we have uh, the person here, the professor, who has actually, you know, re reading from the book, he probably wrote himself. We have the rich students sitting in the front row here. Uh, they were able to buy the book. And, and then we have someone here writing notes. Uh, we have someone with the eye stone. Uh, uh, and then we have some people talking, and we, of course, see what you know, most people do, even if they don't do it physically, sleeping, and thinking about something else. What's amazing is that this has stayed the same way despite these amazing advances in technology. Because a lot of people have said that technology is what drives innovation. So I present to you technologies. It's something, and maybe you're not so familiar with this anymore, uh, a few of you older people might. It's called a book. Uh, and it should have it led to the democratization of education. That when you can start printing these and selling them cheaply, that's an innovation. No value, an idea of value to people. But it, it, uh, it uh, didn't change the way we teach, did it? And then we have something else, uh, like a repository of information that you can move around in something called a computer. And even later now, we have the internet. And we're still teaching in the same way. So this isn't really a question of just fail, fail again, fail better, because that would imply that universities are learning. Uh, but they're not. We're still doing the same things the same ways. So, so that got me thinking. Um, we're probably teaching the wrong things. We're probably teaching it in the wrong ways. But universities are resilient in their ability to, to you know, withstand these attempts of people going in and, and waving the sword and, and riding in on the white horse and saying, now's the time for change. So the question then becomes, what is it that makes universities so effective in resisting change and are there possibilities of driving change or introducing change to university that could change this? So that got me thinking that if we think about the content of education, and that would be the, the way it's delivered, what we talk about, and then we think about the, con the process of change. And then I started looking and observing the way things are done, the way projects are run at the university. And I found the following, that usually it starts off with this idea. This, this idea here, in this case, it's uh, 1935. Uh, we're thinking we need something that can fly long distances and drop things on people's heads. <laughs> so so this, is, this is really good. There's, we're, we're in tune with the environment when we're thinking about this. Uh, so we, we do what we should always do. We, we pull together the, the smartest people, and they sit in a room that's really nice. They get water in the bottles. Uh, and they, you can see maybe post-it notes there, and they, they're trying to figure out. And they come up with the ultimate, ultimate solution. And it looks like this. It's beautiful. It's shiny. It has four motors. Nothing else at that time had that. They were all in you know, two motors and all that. It's so beautiful uh, that, that it's almost I mean, not even necessary to fly it. You can see that, how well it's going to work, right? So, so then they start flying it. And this is what happens. Right? Whoops. Uh, and so they're, they're trying to figure out why this happened. Because I mean, the solution is beautiful, right? And then it turned out like this. And so, so they did this, this big uh, investigation, like you usually do after things like this happen, and they came to this conclusion, how was there, which is obvious, because I mean, the solution was perfect. And, and of course, the, the final conclusion is this. There was obviously too much of an airplane for one man to fly. Let, I mean, beside the fact that they had two of the best pilots at that time. So I thought, maybe this is the problem, that we're, we're doing this is the process of change that we're usually following. So I went out to the literature, like you usually do, uh, when you have a question and you're trying to be a scientist. And I have now constructed a composite of my findings. Uh, and, and this is the article that's entitled uh, Medical Reform. Um, uh, well, 
we almost made it. Um, and it's following the standard uh, structure of, of, sci of scientific articles. So basically, the introduction is that, as we all know, and as I presented to you, education is lagging behind. So we have this method, and that's exactly what I showed you there. The, we assemble this team, we design a solution, and then we communicate it out to everyone to get buy-in. And the results are that sort of failed. Um, and this is interesting because most people won't say they actually failed, just like most pilots will never say that they crashed. It's uh, called augerdian, which is a term from 1200. Uh, and it's the same thing here. We use euphemisms to describe our failures. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, when we get to the discussion, then people start reflecting, why did this happen? And then it's, it's if only we had, it's, if only we had a little bit more money, if only we had stronger leadership, or, or more time, or better people who were less prone to resist our wonderful ideas. And that becomes the conclusion, that successful change is built on strong leadership, having a lot of money, having a lot of time, and having a lot of resources. And wherever you go, when you talk to people, they say, well, I had this great idea, but and then they'll talk about the idiots in the system that got in the way. <laughs> so I was thinking, maybe these are bright people. They've been doing the same thing. But it's also, you remember 1910? These ideas are from 1910 as well. This is scientific management, modern management principles, which are based on the idea that you can take a person, put them in a factory, pay them enough, and they'll do whatever you say. But we know that we're humans, right? And it's not only that we err to be humans, but we're driven by other factors. If anyone has seen Dan Pink's talk on, on uh, TED, he mentions or read his book Drive, it's about finding purpose, it's about developing mastery, and having the space, the autonomy, to do what you, you want to do and follow your passion. But here, we're telling people what to do. Uh, Henry Ford summed it up perfectly. He said, why is it that every time I ask for a pair of hands, they always come with a brain attached? <laughs> so you can understand his frustration when he has a perfect solution and these idiots keep getting in the way. So I thought, maybe these people aren't idiots. Maybe the resistance is because we're telling people to do things that they don't understand about or want to do or they see the reason for doing it. It's not meaningful. So I went back and thought, what does the university look like? And it, think about the university that you work at or been to or studied at, and you find that it's built out of buildings, and each building is a department and they put walls around their department, and they call themselves the Department of Physiology or the, the Center for Management. Yeah. And, and usually these are islands, and they're protecting themselves. And there's a few people, usually students, that go traveling through. But in general, most people isolate behind them, and then nowadays we're sending you know, emails to other people in the world, but we're pretty isolated in our own little islands. If we're trying to drive an organization thinking it's a factory where everyone's on the same floor and we can tell them what to do, and it looks like this, we're working in an entirely wrong environment. Because this is what you can consider a complex system, though. and where people's interaction is what makes growth and learning possible. And it's not possible if you're standing on your own island. So, and, and this, this is sort of the way you can think of it if we, if we add a, a theoretical framework to that, is that we pretend, we act, as if we're working with simple problems or complicated problems, where, where you just put a little more knowledge in it and you'll solve it. But we're actually in an environment where it's the basic interaction is the important part. So getting back to this, I thought, well, myself and another colleague said, why don't we go out to these islands and see what's actually going on? And this is the interesting thing about complex adaptive systems, is change is happening all the time. It's on the periphery. So you don't see it if you're looking at it from the center. Well, you see it on the outside, on the islands. Because they're, you know, they're fixing their gardens, they're planting new trees, they're building their towers a little higher. Uh, and all you need to do is sort of help them see the larger picture, make them realize that they're also part of this archipelago. Sort of like, get them, stop them thinking about their own Tasmania, and they should actually be a Tierra de Fuego, uh, where they're, they're in connection and trade. And so we went out and we asked these people, what is it that, that uh, drives you? What, what are you interested in? What do you want to change? And we discovered this tension between what people want to be doing and what they're actually doing. And when we, through these questions, inadvertently exposed this, all of a sudden people are saying, why am I teaching this course the way I'm teaching it? I mean, do 
graduates of medical school need to know everything about the eye. Maybe they just need to know how to take care of people who have red eyes or, or check the retina. And I only need half a day to teach that. And I have a course that's two weeks long. Get rid of it. And that gave rise to an approach of change, uh, which we call adaptive reflection, which is basically reflecting on the process of, of what's going on and relating it to the world around you. So this is a group of psychiatrists, and, and we've asked them, what's the big picture? And they're brainstorming with post-it notes. And that based on that, they're able to then uh, define what it is they want to achieve in a larger whole and how their course is going to connect to that. And then it's really easy, because all they do is write on a whiteboard these are their goals, this is what they're doing, and all the circles are the ones that are actually helping them get there. That's working. The rest of it, they can get rid of it. And look how much they have that's not that effective. Seeing that, all of a sudden change becomes something easy, but it's something that they see. No one's told them that lectures are bad, which is actually everything that doesn't have a circle on it. And all the things that are circles are activating things, where students are working together in groups or going out and asking patients about different things. And then they sit down and they figure out, well, now that we know what we want to do, now we know that things are working, why don't we do more of the things that are working? And all of a sudden they have a course. No one's told them about modern pedagogical problems or principles or taught them how to teach. They've seen for themselves what works. So that got me thinking. If learning is a product of experience and reflecting on that experience, maybe we can get the, the students to teach the teachers. So now we're into the turn of the tables. We flipped the pyramid. So these are two nursing students who did the exact same thing that I've been doing. I just put, and I'm teaching them a course on how to leadership and education, so I just pulled myself out and then they started uh, doing the exact same things I was doing. And as they were doing it, they were reflecting on the processes of what they were doing. So now they're leaders, leading the people that have been usually teaching them about kidney dialysis and kidney medicine. And here they are, the teachers, brainstorming as the students are watching. And then we get this really interesting reflection from one of the students. I realize that the course is designed completely wrong. We have based it with ourselves in mind and not for those whom we create the course. Moreover, we use traditional inefficient teaching methods and don't involve and activate our students. And this is breaking the hold that lectures and the old way of teaching have on the way we work. And simply by getting them to reflect together with the people who are the teachers on what they're doing. And what was even more amazing is that all of these students decided, well, why don't we write about this? So here is a, a teacher, and the other teacher was myself, taking the picture. And the rest of them are students teaching us about how to write an article. And in, in three days, we drew, pulled up a rough draft, and it's been, since been published in, in uh, the Nurse Education Today. And remember that e-learning thing that we're talking about that was impossible to put in. Here, these students have created e-learning courses, uh, 20 minutes each, that the nurses are able to do and look at in their spare time. And this is courses that are being used today. I think we've created about 26 of these now, or the students have created these, that are the basis for the way they will continue and improve their, their professional development as nurses. And, and all these students uh, have, have been working on it, and the, the hospitals are crying for more. Where are all the nursing students? We need new courses for our nurses. And that got me to the final conclusion here, that leadership is basically about freeing the potential of the people around you. We've seen leadership as a strong person standing in front, coming up with a vision. But what should be doing instead is the opposite is standing behind and letting other people realize their potential. And the basic way to do this, then, is to think of this tension between what we want to do and what we're doing, and realizing a lot of what we're doing today isn't getting us there. So what we can do, and this is where the interesting thing is, leadership all of a sudden becomes a domain of everyone, that we can just go out and ask the people next to each other, or next to us, what do we want to achieve? And what are we doing that will get us there? Thank you so much.